1924. The entire nation, as well as the crowds in Boston Harbor, waited to cheer the first round-the-world flyers. The U.S. Air Service, struggling with a few men, a handful of planes, and very little money, hoped these spectacular achievements would help win public support. Even though it took six months for the sturdy biplanes to circle the Earth, the Air Service was making a victim of space. Traversing more than 27,000 miles, they had flown through every weather on Earth. The conquering heroes, led by Lieutenant Lowell Smith, succeeded where all others had failed and at long last returned home. These six, Harding, Nelson, L.P. Arnold, Wade, Ogden, and Smith, together had reduced the size of the Earth under the leadership of Mitchell and General Patrick, new chief of the Air Service. At the same time, we developed the Barling Bomber. For crew, we had pilots Lieutenants Harris and Muir Fairchild, the designer Barling and engineer Culver. They climbed through the hatch of the monster, which had been shipped to right field in sections. These men were taking a big step toward realizing Billy Mitchell's strategic bombing theories. From his open cockpit, the commander surveyed the man of war and ordered his crew chief to start the six Liberty engines. Four of these were tractors, while two worked as pushers. With everything checked, the pilot gave the signal to taxi toward the takeoff point on the grassy runway. A barling had three wings, which spanned 120 feet, and it stood 27 feet high, dwarfing all air service planes of the time. Meet the Super Dreadnought, biggest attempt at a long-range, load-carrying heavy bomber. In fact, this was the largest ever built in the United States up to then. During construction, it raised many eyebrows because the plane cost somewhere near a half a million dollars. A very high cost for a new airplane idea when the total air service budget was so small. The experimental triplane clumsily started its takeoff for the first time in 1923. 32,000 pounds traveling along at the incredible speed of 61 miles an hour. When it couldn't climb over the Appalachian Mountains, the Barling was grounded and was used to solve engineering problems. It certainly influenced development of the B-17. The next year, President Coolidge looked for the Pan American Goodwill Flyers to land at Bowling Field, Washington. After they had flown 22,000 miles and had visited 25 sister republics, Major Herbert Dargue and his crew were welcomed back to the U.S. The president awarded each flyer a Distinguished Service Cross certificate in a ceremony attended by the cabinet. The new Air Corps chief congratulated the flyers, including future Air Force generals, Lieutenant Ennis Whitehead and Captain Ira Aker. Thus, the Air Corps had demonstrated its diplomatic value to the nation. Also in 1926, Frederick Patterson, head of a group of Ohio businessmen, broke ground for Wright Field. Two years later, Orville Wright raised the flag for our dedication ceremony in the distinguished company of many notables and aviation names. Together, they hallowed the ground for the Air Corps Materiel Division, which was going to build the greatest flying field in the world, near Dayton, home of aviation. America couldn't have had better representation than Orville Wright, Secretary of War Davis, Judge Kennesaw Landis, Assistant Secretary Truby Davison, Air Corps Chief General Patrick, and many others. From the steps of the new headquarters, they witnessed the gun salute. 
squadrons of the latest planes passed in review and hailed right field. Another distinguished Army flight was the first non-stop attempt from California to Hawaii. Ground crews carefully prepared the huge tri-motor Air Corps monoplane called the Bird of Paradise. She was going to fly an untried course mapped out by Lieutenants Maitland and Hagenberger. Oakland airport crowds applauded the two Army flyers as they gunned their engines and started off down the long runway. Hundreds of gallons of gas made a heavy and dangerous load. Finally, the bird of paradise lifted itself off the earth and headed for 2,400 miles of nothing but ocean. Navigation was the chief problem. Using instruments he had designed and developed himself, Hagenberger guided Maitland straight to their goal, an island in the vast Pacific. Less than 26 hours later, the people of Hawaii hurried to get a look at the first airplane flown from the States. Maitland and Hagenberger had made it. Seems that almost everyone in Honolulu came out to say aloha to the two tired but happy men who had spanned the Pacific. This was later regarded as the most perfectly organized and completely planned flight ever attempted. Hagenberger and Maitland triumphantly returned to the States by boat. In the 20s, the Army watched Americans stunt flying the oceans. Charles Lindbergh, Will Rogers and Wiley Post, Amelia Earhart, and many others. The Air Corps learned from successes as well as failures, like this overloaded civilian takeoff. Luckily, Ruth Elder and a pilot were only slightly injured. In the search for greater range, very important to air defense, we sent up the famous question mark to try mid-air refueling, another in the Army's never-ending chain of experiments. The idea was as simple as tapping a beer barrel at 70 miles an hour. First, the tanker plane let down a gas line. After a crewman aboard the question mark caught the hose, contact was made. This was done 43 different times in order to transfer 40 tons of gas, oil, food, batteries, and supplies. Nine of these delicate contacts were made at night. In all, 5,660 gallons of gasoline and 245 gallons of oil were transferred by this air-to-air -air refueling method. After completing a transfer, the question mark threw off the gas line, which was then pulled back into the tanker plane. The experiment continued successfully for nearly a week, breaking every endurance record known. When the question mark finally came down, it proved that a plane could fly 11,000 miles without stopping, and that U.S. Air Corps flight training was the best. Major Carl Spots and his crew, including two other future Air Force generals, were the champion endurance flyers of their time. This was the beginning of the idea that the Air Corps could deliver a payload anywhere on Earth. Even in 1929, the United States Air Arm had shown that strategic operations could be extended to cover half the globe. The question mark's engine showed only trivial wear. If it hadn't been for a plug grease outlet, who knows how many more days they could have stayed aloft. The rugged five-man team was made up of Staff Sergeant Huey, Lieutenant Pete Quesada, Lieutenant Harry Halverson, Captain Ira Aker, and Major Carl Spots. With questions answered, the question mark returned to its hangar. Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Royce, during the severe winter of 1930, led the first pursuit group flying Curtis Hawks through three weeks of exercises and sub-zero temperatures. This was a large-scale operation. For many years, the Air Corps was seriously engaged in cold weather tests for its men and machines. Their concern was with the ice-bound approaches to the American continent. Airplanes had already crossed the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. Eventually, why couldn't enemy aircraft follow the icy meridian straight over the top of the Earth? Just before one mission, a blizzard came freezing up the engines. The men found that crankcase oil became a solid mass. 
Maneuvers such as these demonstrated the vital need for a cold weather testing program. Skis were welded to the ice. Nevertheless, the crews persisted and they got the planes ready to fly. Under the most difficult field conditions and working in frigid temperatures without de-icers, without electrically heated suits and in open cockpits, the Army Air Corps trained to defend America. American air races started in 1920 and continued to focus public attention on flying for 19 years. Remember the 1925 Pulitzer contest? Our entry was a Curtis Hawk. General Patrick instructed Lieutenant Bettis as Jimmy Doolittle looked on. The Navy's entry was the same, except for the paint job and the pilot. Lieutenant Al Williams held the speed record and was confident of success. Bettis was the first to take off. On another section of the field, the ground crew straightened the Navy plane and Williams sped away. There goes the Army. It was a spectacular show around a closed course as Bettis picked up speed. First he equaled Williams' old record, then he went even faster. Williams dished out tough competition. Even before Bettis came in for his landing, everyone knew that the Army had won. The new speed king of the year was Cyrus Bettis, who averaged 249 miles an hour. The Navy entry averaged 242 miles an hour and was given second honors. Two weeks later, in the Schneider International Seaplane Race at Baltimore, Army was represented by Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle. The Navy was in this one too. They both flew Hawks fitted with floats. Britain entered a Napier. Italy, a Machi. The float planes took to the sea. Doolittle was the first to respond to the signal. In the face of top-notch competition, Army was the first to cross the finish line, a 232-mile-an-hour winner. Cleveland Air Race crowds loved the Army maneuvers. The first pursuit group and the 17th attack group in spectacular operations. Lucky Lindy watched the Army write its initials in the sky. During the 20s, the Air Corps proved the airplane was more than a weapon. Although Army flyers had cut time and distance by flying higher, longer, and faster, this period was a constant struggle for recognition. These flights made Americans think about air power. Later chapters in the Air Force story will show the growing importance of the air arm for national defense. The uniting of the new power with America's great industrial capacity made it possible to prepare for the future and to speed the growth of the United States Air Force.